Hello, everybody. Uh, back here uh, with the IAG uh, Symposium on Capacity in the context of our, uh, our current and uh, existing challenges. Uh, I have uh, uh, with me in a great uh, uh, panel and seminar, uh, Len Pritchett and William Moera, as well as Anna San Lorente from IAG. Uh, what we'll do is I'll quickly introduce and then uh, uh, Anna will talk us through the technicalities uh, of the session and how you can all <clears throat> add your questions. Uh, and we try to answer them in the conversation. And then we go to uh, the presentations of both William and Lent. Uh, and William is first. But since William is in Uganda, uh, in a very remote place, um, we will use his pre-recorded presentation. But with Land being in Utah, and thank you so much again, Land, for waking up, well, almost not going to bed, uh, uh, being way behind in time, but not in uh, uh, practice and uh, uh, capacity. Um, uh, Land is, uh, um, agreed to give a shorter version of his presentation and highlighting the, the most critical aspects of that to uh, uh, be able to engage in this conversation. Uh, to start with uh, Land and, and introducing him, and of course I will uh, only have a short time, but uh, uh, development economist, uh, uh, currently the RISE Research Director at uh, Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Born and raised in Utah, uh, where you are now, uh, and um, uh, I suppose that has got to do with the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, worked for the World Bank uh, for quite a bit of uh, time, uh, and uh, 2006, I think, uh, uh, important publication, uh, Let Our People Come, Breaking the Gridlock on Global Labor Mobility, uh, for this, from the Center of Global Development, uh, published um, uh, uh, on how, uh, uh, you know, I think this is one of the, the major pieces of his research. Uh, what I find interesting uh, for the conversation of today in how we bring change and build capacity in the context of crisis is, um, uh, is your uh, approach on the isomorphic mimicry, uh, uh, how you can translate one to the other, which is definitely a misinterpretation uh, and often a, a failing approach. Uh, and I, I will look forward to also part of that, uh, of your reflection. Um, thanks for joining, Lent. Um, William, William Muraway. Uh, formerly CEO of the Uganda National Water Sewage Corporation, is now executive director of the Global Water Leaders Group. Um, uh, and William is partially responsible for one of African water industry's great success stories, the turnaround of the Uganda Water and Sewage Corporation. Uh, so he's a leader by practice, uh, and um, uh, he will definitely talk us through what that type of leadership means, uh, also in the context of, uh, of you could almost say daily challenges, but definitely not uh, in the context of the current uh, crisis. Um, with, uh, you left the corporation, I think, in 2011, uh, uh, yes. and, uh, working across Africa, uh, uh, bringing your uh, uh, knowledge and capacity to other utilities uh, across uh, with your firm. And since 2013, uh, uh, appointed ED of the Global Water Leaders Group, uh, uh, I guess. So thank you both for joining. Okay, yeah. uh, 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 William is uh, in, uh, well, Lent is in Utah. Uh, William is in uh, a remote village uh, in the southwestern part of Uganda. Uh, on the top of a, a double bed, um, <laughs> as, as close to the Wi-Fi as possible. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's amazing uh, here from I'm I'm sitting at home in Rotterdam. Uh, Anna is uh, at home at I too or at IAG. Yeah, IAG. At IAG, uh, land in Utah and William in Uganda. And we try to bring this conversation together. So thanks so much for joining. Uh, Anna, please talk us through the technicalities before we go to the presentation of William. Sure. Uh, good morning or good day, everyone. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the feature chat, which I see that there's already been introduced some uh, messages. Uh, there just below is where you can type your message and your questions directed to the speakers. This leads me to let you know that before on top of the chat, there's been um, 
code question on how you can ask direct questions to the speakers. And also just above all the messages, you will find a handout that uh, provides further details on how you can engage before, during, and um, after the webinar itself. Um, I would advise you to make use of um, some engagement on the social media as well by making use the hashtag of CaptiveSimp. And uh, with that said, I'm going to give back the floor to Henk. Thanks so much, uh, Anna, for uh, letting us know. I think the, uh, what we will try to do in this session too is uh, where both uh, William and Lent uh, see where the, 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 most, uh, the most pressing issues and lock-ins are in the way we approach uh, our challenges. Um, and difficulties to really move to action. Uh, I think the corona crisis uh, more than ever exposes us to uh, a challenge where we fall back to former practices, uh, start repeating mistakes of the past uh, and uh, making us more vulnerable in that context while knowing it. Uh, so it's like, uh, it's not even a rabbit on the road looking into the, the headlights of a car, it's a rabbit running towards these headlights uh, with almost uh, uh, enjoyable, amazing speed. Uh, so there, something is definitely wrong. Uh, and, and finding a way out uh, is where we want to uh, use the capacity of both Land and William to uh, explore opportunities to bypass from their perspectives. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, give the floor to William. Um, but uh, doing this, I would uh, like Anna to start the presentation, uh, William recorded. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to thank UNESCO IH Institute for having organized this symposium to discuss the topic that affects all of us, especially in this coronavirus period. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Water is more critical than ever before. Secondly, I'd like to thank UNESCO IHE that has trained a big number of water professionals across the globe. Everywhere you go, you will meet an IHI alumni. In my company, National Water Uganda, where I used to work, almost half of the engineering section were trained, including their new MD, were trained at UNESCO IG. We appreciate. One, thank you so much for the good job well done. Continue. I'm locked down in a remote village in the western part of Uganda, where I'm communicating with you from. I'd like to thank Professor Alats, Dr. Cotton, and all their teams for having invited me to join you in this symposium. Of course, I would also like to thank my IT team in Kampala, my lovely, dear daughter, Lisa, for having made it possible for me to communicate with you. I apologize for any inconveniences that may have been caused. In my keynote presentation, I'm not going to, del to delve into theories of change management and managing change in organizations. This is well catered for in the literature and extensively taught at our great institutions like IHA here. I'm rather going to discuss with you live practical examples of people within and outside our sector who have turned around their organizations and touched lives of so many people. I will then share with you the things they have in common what it takes to change an organization, the prerequisite for change from my own experience, and then I will conclude. Ladies and gentlemen, looking at the symposium program, I note that we have a sector with lots of challenges, as you hear from some of the speakers. At the same time, the sector has resources. It has manpower. It has policymakers, it has great scientists, it has educational institutions, and also, same time, 
it has companies, great companies, great organizations that are charged to run and supply water and sanitation services to the population. Gentlemen and ladies, the biggest question, however, why is the sector still lagging behind? Why is water service delivery still a problem? By the way, not only in developing countries, but also in some big parts of the developed institutions of developed countries. I'm only here to set the scene and invite you in further discussions. Ladies and gentlemen, let's meet our new iterator boss. As you can see from this slide, this man is completely troubled, he's stressed. Demands and expectations are coming from all directions. As you can see, politicians, customers, financiers, even animals are demanding his attention. You can imagine what situation he is in. Ladies and gentlemen, that was how I felt 13 years at the helm of National Water. Every time, every moment, I would feel I'm completely stressed. And I know many of you will not look different. You have been managing great institutions. May not be different, may not feel different, like our new utility boss. What is happening indeed to the sector? The state of the current situation, the typical performance of our utilities in developing economies is not making a situation better. Look at the slide. Low service coverage, intermittent water supply. I've visited many institutions. I've visited many countries. Sometimes it's like a miracle if they can get at least two hours of supply per day. Low operation efficiencies, high non-revenue down, 50 to 70 percent. And of course, low correction efficiencies from 40 to 70 percent. Imagine you are losing 70 percent of the water, you're only bidding 40 percent of it, and you're collecting like 30 percent. What operational efficiency is that? Poor organizational culture, field corrupt staff, late coming, drunkenness, poor incentive structure. All these are affecting our institutions day by day. As you look from the next slide, most of these utilities are locked up in a spiral of poor performance. Ladies and gentlemen, it all starts from low tariffs, low corrections, managers not being able to be autonomous, subsidies, high subsidies, the service deteriorates, and of course the systems go down the drain. Crisis after crisis. Do we have any hope? Is there any hope for us? Can this sector be turned around? Yes. Water, like any other institution, can be turned around. We only need game changers. We need visionaries. We need people with the will to do it. And it can be done. Let's borrow it from a few examples of people who have taken up the challenge and change the organizations and hence the lives of so many people around them. I'll really take four cases, two within the sector and two outside the sector. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Muhammad Ali Dangote, a Nigerian, at the moment the richest man in Africa, by the way, in actual fact, the richest black man in the world with his asset worth of 15 to 20 billion US dollars. After his university at the age of 22, he borrowed only $1,000 from his uncle and started a trading business. And it was doing very well, but later he realized that he had to change his business from mere trading to manufacturing. He spotted two sectors, the food sector and the shelter sector. And he has built a vibrant industry that cuts across Africa, Middle East, and South America. 
religion that people would fear to venture into. He has changed the face and art of doing business down there with his slogan, I want every household in Africa to enjoy the Dangote product. His vision, ladies and gentlemen, right from the start was to provide an excellent service and an excellent product to every household in Africa. And he's done it. On the other hand, Steve Jobs, after his second comeback in 1997, the company had co-founded and was going down the drain. He changed his fortunes and turned into the most valuable company on the globe, worth US trillion dollars. With his slogan, every household in America should have a laptop, he transformed Apple into the world class company it is today. Now let's come to our own sector. Of course, one would say, do we have people who can do it? I've looked in South American territory. I looked Africa. I went to Asia. Yes, there are people who have really done it and done it very well. But we shall take only two examples. Dr. Silva Mugisha of National Water Uganda expanded and modernized the National Water of Uganda after taking it over from me in 2011. In his own words, he said, Doctor, you've done very well. You've only concentrated on the financial viability of this company. You've actually turned it around. But me, I'm going to expand it. I'm going to make sure that, in his own words, every household in all urban centers in Uganda will get reliable piped water systems. He has expanded the urban water service business uh, from just the 23 towns I was managing to over now 250 towns all across the country. Those who are well acquainted with the African water business will bear me with this. On the Asian side, however, Ek Son Chan of Cambodia, now a Minister of Infrastructure and Water, having been promoted for having done a wonderful job at the water company, has changed non Bain Water Company to a world-class listed public water institution. One of the first ones of its kind in the water sector. In his own words, he says, nothing is impossible. It can be done. But what are the common features of these turnaround goals? What can we learn from them? One, all of them will tell you that there is technological disruption. The world is changing. New technologies are emerging. We cannot use the 19th century products to satisfy the 21st century demands. Nor can we use the 19th century technology to produce the 21st century products. If you are going to succeed, if you want to change your institution, you must look at the technology. The technology is changing. Secondly, the customer demands are becoming more and more higher than ever before. Customers are demanding. They want different goods at different times. So if you want to change, you must look at the customer demand. Thirdly, the stakeholders are demanding for accountability to their investments and the involvement in their business. They need to see vibrant oriented institutions. They need to see goods and services being given to the people. They need to see a return of the investments that must force you to change your way of doing things. Fourthly, and I think for me, most important, people want to make a name. They want to leave a legacy. As you well know, today's footprint is tomorrow's legacy. Take example, Mr. Dangote. He wanted in his dream, he wanted to see an industrialized Africa before he dies. Steve Jobs, on the other hand, he wanted to, to see every household in the world not only in America, 
to have at least, if not a laptop, but at least an Apple product in their home. And you can see, whoever he is, I think he must be very, very happy. If you look around yourselves, you will see an Apple product. That was his legacy. Dr. Mugisho of Uganda wants every urban center in Uganda to have piped water systems. And I think he wants to be remembered for that. Exxon Chan of Cambodia wanted to create the first listed company in the region. And he did it. And he's remembered for that. But what does it take to change these utilities? How do we unlock our potential? and turn these ailing institutions around ladies and gentlemen. One, we must change our thinking. We must change our attitudes. Attitude is everything. There is no way we can solve the current problems with the same thinking that causes them. In actual fact, when I was having a discussion with my staff, they wanted to introduce a policy some three months ago and I was hesitating because, you know, as a manager, you have to be a bit conservative. You don't know what's going to happen. One of them put up her hand and said, Sir, if you can't change it, at least change your attitude. She took the day and the policy was adopted. And I think that's done a good job. Two, we must create dreams and big dreams at that. All the four personalities I've presented to you had big dreams, had visions. They were looking far ahead. If you want to change this sector, if you want to change the organization, you must look far ahead than you are looking at now. Three, you must be able to put your staff and customers first. This is very, very important. Of course, there is a big debate among scientists and practitioners, whether the customer first or the staff first. The turnaround gurus will tell you that you need good people around you to create a good customer base that will create the business you want to do. This is a subject we can still discuss further. For, ladies and gentlemen, we must commit ourselves to excellence. Our customers, our stakeholders, are becoming more demanding in quantity and the quality of the services we are offering. With the 21st century technological disruption and artificial intelligence, only those who provide excellent services will survive. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, you must enjoy what you are doing. I always have a big battle with my staff. I tell them that there is no way you can do what you are not enjoying. You must have fun in your business. In actual fact, you will only succeed if you like what you are doing. And someone also told me that you may not succeed in what you dislike. Again, it's up to you for discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, our institutions are full of bureaucratic tendencies. The environment around us is so bureaucratic that the way to succeed in changing our organizations lies in how we make them autonomous, accountable, and provide them with incentives and penalties to excel. You will not be surprised that in my 13 years at National Water, my performance incentives were higher all the time than my salary. Also, I was penalized once. I lost my salary once in the 13 years. But that meant even all my staff members, the entire company staff had to lose their money. That was the day that we will never forget. How would you go home and tell your family that you've been going to work for 30 days with no salary? It never happened again. And I think that was the beginning of the turnaround. 
All in all, we used to pay more than $2 million per annum for incentives only. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, we must be obsessed with the will to provide water and sanitation services everywhere we are. I'm happy that I'm discussing with water leaders, policymakers, trainers, and water professionals like you. I'll leave you with this quotation from one of the greatest sportsmen ever, so many people say, Muhammad Ali. He says, champions are not made in the gyms. In other words, change agents like you are not made in your wonderful schools and education institutions. He continues to say that change agents, the champions, have something inside them, the desire, the dream, the vision to change things. Yes, they have the skill and the will, but the will must be stronger than the skill. Yes, have uh, many of you I know would like to read, maybe to uh, find out where I've got most of the information. Yes, have uh, at the end of this, I've given you a few biographies to read. You can read uh, Steve Jobs. You can read Dangote. I've uh, given you the, the titles. And also, don't forget my book, Make, Making Public Enterprises uh, Work. You'll get all the ways we used to change the National Transfer Corporation in my 13 years. I thank you. Thanks so much, uh, William, for sharing uh, uh, not only your insights from uh, uh, Uganda practice, but also reflections on uh, what is needed to change the curve uh, from both a leadership perspective uh, as well as very practical. Uh, I must say that uh, the, the challenge remains that uh, while we might or might not be obsessed uh, with water and sanitation for everyone everywhere, we still lack way behind as a uh, international and uh, a global world with over 2 billion people lacking access to safe drinking water and over 4 to sanitation. So there's a, there, there's a lot that needs to be done. But before we dive into yeah. questions based on your presentations and exploring more, I'd like Lent uh, to give his uh, comments, uh, reflection and presentation in uh, uh, right now. So Lent, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm um, happy to join here. I, I feel I'm somewhat of an odd duck or maybe a duck out of water because I don't actually know anything about water. Uh, I'm not a professional or expert in the water sector. I'm honored to be on a platform with uh, people like William that have had experience in actually turning around corporations. Um, I have a recorded presentation that's available, but I'm going to, in the interest of making sure we have plenty of time for interaction, just try and summarize what I said in 20 minutes and maybe seven minutes. Uh, and it's mainly trying to draw lessons across sectors. Um, two of my areas of research are on how to build state capability and on education and those combine. And so what I mainly wanna bring is what are the lessons that I've learned <clears throat> and have been learned from the education sector for that might be relevant for the water sector. Uh, and by the education sector, I mainly focus on basic education, kind of K to 12, what people call basic education. And the main lesson to be learned from um, <clears throat> basic education is that it's very difficult to make a transition from success to success. And what I mean by that is if you have had success, in creating one dimension of what you need to do in order to be successful. And in particular, in the education sector, that has been that there actually has been a massive, reasonably global progress in expanding the systems, the system in terms of the number of children who attend school and the years that they attend school. And that success was brought about mainly through a certain type of organizational and system capacity, and that was capacity to, to do the logistics of expansion. Uh, 
So organizations were created in a mode that was focused on and consistent with things like building exactly the same school in every village of Indonesia and making sure that there was a human resource policy that put a teacher in every school. Um, and that is what we call in our analytical categorization in terms of capability, logistical capability. And by logistical capability, we kind of mean that if everybody just kind of follows some reasonably simple specified set of rules, you can achieve your targets. Uh, the challenge in the education sector is that in many countries of the world, the same mechanisms, the same organizational habits, processes, practices that have led to success in the expansion, the, avail the physical availability of a school building that a child can attend have not had the same uniform success in providing an actual learning environment. So in some countries of the world, uh, the system has expanded and you actually get high quality education such that children emerge from schools actually with the skills they need. And in other places in the world, the exact same logistical capabilities of expansion have succeeded in expanding the number of years of schooling, but the actual learning content is just abysmally low. And the challenge and what I think the lessons we've learned from our more general research on organizational, what we call organizational capability, is that modes and mentalities of capacity building that are in fact well adapted to the logistical challenge of building out a system are completely maladapted to the more subtle implementation needing to elicit voluntary um, and empowered action by agents around specific performance related purposes. So shifting organization of modality and mentality from capacity for process compliance to capacity for purpose fulfillment has proven very difficult in part because you have been successful. And once you have been successful at a certain type of activity, it creates the sort of illusion that there's this generic sense of capacity and doing more of the same will lead to success in the next, uh, in, in very different type of endeavors. So, our main emphasis, both in our work on building state capability and specifically on education, is how do you create a pathway to build new capacities, even inside organizations and systems that have been successful at doing first generation tasks with very different kinds of capacities and capabilities. We call that approach um, problem-driven iterative adaptation, or PDIA. And one of the key elements of PDIA is to recognize that capacity is a specific thing, not a generic thing. One doesn't, in fact, say, I'm going to acquire some athletic capacity of some generic type, and then later decide what sport or activity you're going to devote that capacity to. Rather, you say, here is the actual performance capacity I would like <laughs> in a specific activity. And then one develops a strategy for achieving those specific capacities. So that's uh, in that sense, we want to avoid what we call isomorphic mimicry, which is a term that we've adopted from organizational sociologists of isomorphism, which is just mimicking what other people have done and creating processes and structures that look like other organizations that have had success. So our emphasis is in order to have success in building the capabilities you need to solve the challenges you're facing, um, our approach is that one builds capability by delivering results, rather than one builds capacity and then delivers results, um, which takes the notion that capacity is some generic abstract thing that can be developed independent of tasks. So I think um, the main, I think a main lesson from the education sector is um, transforming organizations towards new modalities of building capacity 
is very difficult and it requires a reorientation away from process compliance as the sole goal of um, as if achieving some compliance with some set of rules is in fact the objective towards more clearly stated purposes, more adaptive and autonomy to achieve those purposes within organizations, which sounds thankfully very much like what William was saying about the way one accomplishes organizational transformation. Um, and so that is, I think, the main thing we want to say is that the danger of the continued sort of talk about capacity building is if one assumes that there's a generic set of capacities and that those capacities can be developed independently of the tasks to which those capacities are going to be developed, one will focus on continued honing in on a mostly isomorphic vision of what organizations should look like rather than focusing in on what are the practices one needs to embody in order to fulfill the purposes that the organization is trying to strive for. And the shift from process compliance to purpose-driven is a key shift um, that needs to happen to mostly tackle the more implementation intensive second generation issues beyond the expansion of physical infrastructure. But we wanna emphasize that you actually even inside reasonably well-functioning organizations, much less disaster, you know, quite dysfunctional organizations, one needs to have a conscious strategy of building new capabilities to meet these new purposes. So I'll uh, stop there in order to give us time for questions and answers. And I encourage you to look at the slides that I have prepared with great graphics and facts to back up everything I've just said. <laughs> Th thank you very much, Lent. I think um, although you're not a water duck, as you said, uh, you're definitely mm -hmm. not the old duck, but the experienced one for sure. Uh, <laughs> and it also really helps us, uh, especially in the in the water space where uh, water is so much linked to all other uh, challenges. Eh? Without water, uh, it's women and kids that walk the well. So there's social dimensions with poor water quality or no water availability. There's health and hygiene issues. Water is destructive for our economy, our biodiversity, mm -hmm. and so forth. So the linkages are critically important. So a water perspective in itself does not address the challenges you face. What I really like about the two of you uh, together in this panel, also in the current context, is that copy paste is a you know is like the, it's a stupid thing to do. Uh, uh, replication and scale as main drivers of success fail and this is what uh, uh, land has been not only researching but showing around the world uh, by both state capabil capability programs as well as educational programs is that you know, it's not enough to just build a school and then a thousand it is really about creating an, an environment based on what you want to achieve and not what you want to put in uh, and i think in the current COVID response and recovery, scale and replication are therefore perhaps the ones we have to be most careful with. Uh, because this is what we see around the world is that it is everywhere, but it is everywhere different. Uh, and I find it uh, fascinating to see where and it so uh, dire is that uh, Africa has an average age of uh, a little over 19, Gaza a little over 17, Europe is way close to 50. Mm -hmm. Uh, where you, do you see COVID-19 exposed and impacting most? It is white, male, rich, fat men. Uh, it, uh, those are the most vulnerable in the context of the current crisis. But the, the next impact, uh, being it economic and on food security, is exactly there where the vulnerability to the real pandemic might not be so tough. Uh, but the rippling effect of this pandemic across the world. So we have to be very careful in, in what we do. And I think, Land, you really pushed on this. I, I, I'd like to bring the two of you together and see if there, there is a, a little bit of exchange between both William and Land. Is that William takes a human-centric approach, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, trying to build cultural change from within the organization. Uh, and this is what you uh, uh, did in uh, Uganda at the Water uh, uh, Authority. But... Um, how much do you recognize from what Land said the moment you started to bring this to other uh, organizations? There is no copy-paste. How do you reinvent the, the approach, the process towards the result? 
and lend uh, to you if you hear William's story and uh, saw his presentation, uh, how much uh, uh, indeed feeds back into your finding in the context of uh, state capability as well as educational practices, where you say, ah, these are the, uh, uh, these are and these indeed uh, the common parts where we can learn from now if we look at the dire situation in the context of water. But William first. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Hank. Uh, really, this was uh, important uh, for me to be with you. Yes, I've seen so many questions here, I hope, but let me first tackle yours. Yes, what you say, there's no copy and paste, you're right. Uh, there is no um, solution for everything. And what I said in my presentation from my experience, I think uh, we have the solutions. We ourselves, I, I saw it when I came to the National Water. Uh, the people were there. The infrastructure, as you normally call it stupid or stupid, was also there. And the money was also flowing. Uh, but things were not moving. So I think most, most important, uh, I think, and that's what Lant was trying to talk about, are the people. So you must have the people. You must have the innovative mind of the characters you have. And of course, having them alone is not enough. As someone was asking here on, uh, on the questions, you must be able to incentivize them. Are they incentivized enough that they are able, out of their own, to come up with ideas, which ideas you can implement and ideas will save the situation. So there are no copy uh, um, paste answers, but we have the people and people must be uh, incentivized. They must be penalized at the same time as you had. I was penalized when I was not able to achieve what I was supposed to achieve. And then you will get your answers. So answers are not going to come from the moon, but they are going to come from the people with it. Lent? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, you too. Uh, Lent, if, so, you, if you hear William, uh, can you respond? Yeah, I, I enjoyed yeah. William's presentation because one of the, I think, almost paradoxical um, things that we have discovered in thinking about how to build organizational capability is that your first instinct in confronting I love that in his slides, he mentioned drunkenness as one of the sort of challenges you faced inside an organization. So you're facing an organization that's sort of radically out of compliance with the ideal of a well-oiled machine working as an organization. Often people's first instinct is sort of discipline and punish. You know, we need to like crack down on the people who are low performing, whereas our approach within problem-driven adaptation is to unleash positive deviation. You need to find the people in the organization who you can are there, have capacities that are underfulfilled, and give them opportunities to unleash their own innovativeness and capabilities. So in a weird way, you need less structure if you identify purposes you're trying to achieve and unleash the existing capacities within the organization towards those purposes, and then deal with the dysfunction by drawing the dysfunction towards the purpose-driven practices rather than, um, and so, which to some extent, you know, it, it, I love that Williams kind of have fun. Again, it seems paradoxical. You could walk into a dysfunctional organization and have fun, because if you perceive it as a, as a just enforcing compliance, that's no fun for anybody. And it almost turns into an anti-staff perspective. Whereas one of our many kind of metaphors and models is you can't beat a turtle to move. You know, no. organizations that have survived at low performance levels for a very long time have developed very hard shells that can resist external attack and can resist kind of external pressures and can continue. And so if you attempt to kind of move a turtle along by beating it with a stick, you will get tired of beating the turtle long before the turtle gets tired of being beaten. And 
you know, there will be reform episodes and there will be leadership and it will all sort of roll off of the core of the organization. Whereas unleashing the core of the organization towards a purpose by creating opportunities and uh, incentives for those in the organization who can be purpose driven to unleash their potential is I think a huge part of real organizational reform. And it has less to do with management boxes and less to do with rules compliance and much more to identifying problems to which existing capacities can be built by unleashing them. And the turtle wins the, from the hair anyway, you know, the favor. Yeah. That's right. It doesn't really matter. Uh -huh. um, uh, but uh, so you're, the incentives uh, there are critically important. At the same time, what is, uh, is challenging the water world is that we lag behind so massively. Uh, uh, a third of the world population lacks access to uh, safe drinking water. Now with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, it, it's part of a first line of defense, so more criti critically important than ever. And the water world really struggles, uh, you know, gov governmental, private sector, on how to overcome this massive gap. And with sanitation, the gap is even bigger. So how do we prevent uh, replicating the wrong strategies now because we have an enormous unleashed uh, investment opportunity, uh, trillions of dollars will go into infrastructure. Uh, and before you know it, will, it will go exactly in the replicate uh, uh, scale, copy paste way uh, and building the wrong systems, uh, both organizational as well as real physical. Uh, so uh, your insights from both of you actually really could help drive a different uh, approach or perhaps even to say an agenda. Uh, and since with this conference, we're also drafting an agenda that we're going to present next week. Uh, it's going to be critically important to help inform those decision makers that in the end do make decisions on these trillions of dollars that are either going to be spent in the right approaches, uh, projects and, and organizations or replicating past models for more vulnerability. William. Uh, I, I think the um, most important thing here in our business is not money, because money, money has always been there. And um, as you say, even in your own presentation, you know, the, the infrastructure, they are there, they are great. You know, monies have been collected, infrastructures have been built, uh, but things have not changed. So um, uh, from my experience, I think um, it's more of changing the way we are doing things. I mean, we, we, must, we must look at our attitudes today. We must look at our mindsets. Where does it hurt most? What is it we require? And, and, and I think with that, we should not be worried so much. I'm worried when people start thinking only about money, and forget that their own attitude. I, I give you an example. When I had a problem in my office and I was trying to uh, look for the solution and very many people are bringing all sorts of uh, ideas and I was saying no to almost everything. And then one staff put up hand and said, no, no, please. Uh, yes, I know you, you may not want to change it, but can you please change your way of thinking? And when that happened, I, everything was okay. She had the day. And the, the system was adopted uh, and there was no problem without even additional money I was afraid of. So I, I think we should more look at our way, at the way we are looking at things now, the way we think now, our attitudes towards what um, we think is happening. Then we, we get maybe vision leaders, people who are able to look ahead and then come up with solutions that will sort of the current problems. But otherwise, um, I think money and technology alone, those trillions and trillions of dollars we are putting on the table not work mindsets. Yeah. Lent? Yeah, yeah thanks, William. Um, so I, I'm partly responding to what William just said and partly responding to the questions that are flowing by. And I think two common question, two questions that have come up a number of times for which I think that our problem driven iterative adaptation approach to building capability inside organizations have 
different answers than what you would usually hear. And the first is on leadership. Um, you know, uh, we, Matt Andrews, who works with uh, and is part of the team on building state capability, did a study of success cases in the developing world where there's a group of academics at Princeton that have accumulated this large body of documented successes across a variety of sectors in the developing <laughs> world. And one of the things they learned from that <laughs> is that we often, uh, you know, point to a single leader as being kind of a dynamic response. But what we found is that in most of the success cases, when people were interviewed and asked who was the leader of this reform effort or this change effort, um, in many of the success cases, we would get a dozen or more different people named as the leader of the reform effort. So it wasn't, uh, it, you know, there might have been a single visionary creating space, but in order for the reform to actually happen, one needed to have a whole variety of people that were each look to as leaders of the reform and that the main characteristic that we found of leadership was creating who people regard as, as the leader of a change effort was the person who had made possible their engagement in doing something new and different to address a problem. So who they saw as the leader was not necessarily the person nominally with formal authority, but who they saw as the leader was the person that enabled them to become productively engaged in solving the problem. So I think uh, a notion of leadership of kind of creating space for others to unleash their potentials rather than leadership necessarily being providing the solution and direction from the top down, I think is a key notion uh, that looks to the capability of the organization as a kind of broad network of engaged people. Um, so before you go to your second, because this, oh. this, uh, 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 sorry to intervene, but this really uh, uh, resonates again also with your point where you say, and I experience it myself in the diff diff different organizations I led is around the world, but William also, also is a great showcase. If you focus on where the good dynamics are in your organization, instead of where you try to uh, uh, punish where the, 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 the negative aspects are. There's a two sides to that. One, you really improve your organization. Second, um, uh, 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 you uh, uh, credit the ones that are actually willing mm -hmm. to change with you instead of that you focus all your attention on where it's not going well. I, you always come across, also from a managerial and organizational perspective, that there's more time wasted on where it's going wrong then that is uh, is spent on the time where things are going right. So this also, eh, making sure that you create room, space, and capacity, say, and, and I would uh, therefore also say safety in that, eh, that there is the opportunity to do better uh, and create a, a culture of trust where that opportunity also is used and explored and exploited where, you know, uh, making failure is actually a next step to being more successful eh? that learning capacity is going to be critically important yeah so thanks for your leadership your second point Lent. <laughs> i think just that 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 idea of creating safety i think is an interesting idea one has to create space for other people to innovate in it without um you know without suffering negative repercussions if they're not immediately successful because uh you know oftentimes the compliance culture you know I, I and i'm sort of slightly deviating from the second point but i often hear that organizations are you know afraid of failure which is completely the total opposite of the truth yes the truth is that organizations exist to perpetuate failure without blame and <laughs> unleashing the possibility for people to do positive things without blame yeah. in order to create success is actually a very big challenge because oftentimes the existing organizational structures exist to perpetuate failure without individual blame. Right. And so one can have, you know, it, it can't be the case that the water situation William was describing was one in which the organization was afraid of failure. Uh, it was living failure. 
and yet at the same time was creating an environment in which there was fear of innovation and fear of change, and so creating a positive environment for change. The second thing I just want to mention is that one of the uh, people have asked kind of key factors of success for a PDAA-like approach, and, and one of those is to really pay attention to the problem definition stage of creating the space for action. Um, too often, the problem seems so pressing and so obvious that you ignore the fact that you actually need to create um, consensus around a consensus up, down, and sideways to your organization around exactly how the problem is being framed. Because only, and again, this goes back to things William was saying, is this commitment to excellence, this commitment to excellence had to first construct a problem definition in which people agreed on what the performance of the water sector would look like in order that we had a vision of where we were going so that then you could mobilize action around a set of performance-oriented rather than compliance-oriented objectives. That is often ignored. Oftentimes donors and leaders and people come in assuming that the problem is already sufficiently internally understood in the mindset of people that you can just move ahead to the solution phase. But we often find that, you know, in practice, you can spend three months, six months, a year just building the consensus around the problem definition. And that once you've invested in creating a core consensus of the stakeholders of the organization around problem, then it's much easier to unleash things that can build capability to solve the problem, where it's just starting in assuming we know what the problem is and therefore we know what to do and therefore we know what capacities we need, often skips that really essential mindset shift of, what is in fact our performance orientation, which again, I think is a really important part of what William was saying was, um, you know, you had this water utility, it had these vague and conflicting ideas about what it was doing. Whereas until you could say, here is what excellent performance looks like, you really couldn't unleash the potential of anyone. Thanks, Lent. And this is really touching upon the fact that uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the challenges, seemingly be so uh, uh, single, uh, eh, while they're far more complex, uh, without uh, investing a lot in really understanding uh, the complexity of them, understanding interdependencies and vulnerabilities across a broader spectrum than that they are perceived from. You will never get to approaches, let alone solutions, let alone organizational or state capabilities uh, that can sustainably work on them. Yeah, there might be a short-term solution, but it, is only, it will only turn into a Band-Aid approach that will fix the bleeding for a day, uh, uh, but will not, uh, uh, <laughs> will not deliver success on the longer term. Is this, William, to, uh, and, and then we'll have to wrap this up. You touched upon a lot of the cues that uh, are coming in. I can ensure the audience that uh, all questions will be answered um, uh, offline and feedback to you, but a lot of the uh, cues are taken into the comment of uh, William and, uh, and, and Lent already. Is this, this part of understanding the problem, mm -hmm. uh, uh, really um, making sure that that is, uh, you know, jump, not jumping to conclusions based on a, 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 first, pers a first perception. Uh, is that an, uh, something that resonates with you too? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, yes, you're right. So many questions are coming in, and maybe if you allow me to go quickly through some of them, which are very pertinent. Uh, someone, Ben, Ben Bella, wanted to know about who um, relies so much on government funding. Yes, I think in the long run we may have to uh, rely so much on uh, government funding because what? Uh, yes, we say water is a commercial good, but in actual fact. Uh, it's not 100% commercial. So if you want to make it affordable to each and every one, you may have to look for a mix. So we will, I know in the near future, we may go for public funding, but uh, I think the uh, government funding, our grants and whatever will still be 
important in the business. Then, of course, the issue of incentives. Yes, uh, Guy, Professor Guy wanted to know, yes, about the incentives. Yes, it's very, very important to have the right incentives. In actual fact, all what we are talking about, if we have the good leader, and someone also was saying this, you, you may have the good leader, fine, but you need to get people who are better than the good leader. You need to select people who are better than the good leader. I do agree with that assertion. In actual fact, in my case, I think most of my managers whom I chose myself were better than me, were, you know, hire, you know, very good engineers, and that's what happened to, I mean, that's what uh, made things move. So uh, as a leader, you must be able to identify the people, the people who are actually much, much better than you, who know the business even much, much better than you. For you as a leader, just give them the vision, give them where you want to go, where you want to take the institution, and the rest, those um, able able staff can do the job. But of course, as Guy says, uh, Professor Guy says, uh, you must put the right incentives in place. Because without those incentives, certainly, because uh, as I always say, we. Uh, in the water business, it's not like um, an NGO. It's not a church organization where people go and work and uh, and expect God to say thank you to them. No, people they must take it as a business. And if it's a business, then the incentives must also be very very important. And then someone was talking about the targets. Yes, the targets keep on moving. And in my case at National, we didn't have any static targets. I mean, every season, when you meet the current targets, then of course the targets must be renewed, must be higher. Sometimes we'll even double the targets. Because once you are able to achieve, those the targets you have been able to achieve, they are no longer very important. So we go to next level of targets. So targets, target settings, very, very important. You must keep changing the targets. Also, of course, you must also keep changing the incentives. Because you cannot pay the same uh, incentives for the same targets you set some time back. So as you improve on the incentive uh, on the targets, you also improve on the incentives. Yes, of course, uh, I, I do agree with uh, Land that uh, uh, you, you need to create space uh, for our leaders and for the managers, especially to be able to to innovate and uh, create the space for new ideas. Um, of course, the ideas are there, and you'll find that in my company, in actual fact, we did not import any idea at all. The ideas were within the company. You need only to incentivize those characters, you give them what it takes, you allow them, you do away the bureaucracy, you put them under those performance-based targets, and you will get uh, what you think. So uh, I think for some of the questions which are coming in, I will be able to um, respond to them online. And if you are not satisfied, please get back to me. I am available full time, and I'll make sure that, that at least we we give justice to this topic because it's very very important for us. I work in like um, now seven or eight countries in the whole world, and we have the same same problem. The leadership is number one. Two, of course, the, the will to do the job itself, are they willing to do it? Um, how corrupt are they? How corruptible can they be? Can they really move things? Then, of course, uh, lastly, can they get the people uh, without any interference from whichever authorities? And that's, that's what I call the uh, giving the people the autonomy and, of course, making them accountable so that they can move the sector at will, not being forced to do it. Okay, that's all I would say. Yeah, yeah. thanks, William. Um, only because of time, I think we have to round up uh, the conversation. We're three minutes already past the hour. Um, <clears throat> I must say, resonating again, what Land and William uh, said is that uh, uh, if leadership is uh, dedicated to create that safe space environment and build trust, the capacity is within your organizations. <clears throat> but also, of course, in the coalitions you build as an organization in the environment you operate. Uh, and that spillover effect is critically important. Uh, we see the same uh, uh, creation of safe spaces in the way we develop uh, uh, our environment. Uh, we call them soft spaces. Uh, so there's a real opportunity to, uh, um, to learn more uh, there on how that learning environment can be uh, capacitated more. Um, I want to thank the both of you, Land, for getting up really early and joining us. Uh, um, I want to uh, thank William for uh, jumping on, off, and on the uh, on the the double bed uh, in his house uh, remotely in Uganda. Um, your presentations uh, touched upon the critical points of leadership and how to 
move forward. Um, uh, currently, in the current crisis and with the, uh, the SDGs uh, lagging behind so much, uh, we, will, we will need your talent, expertise and capacities in. So uh, thanks so much for joining uh, uh, the community. I want to thank the audience uh, for being with us uh, and asking so many questions that we try to incorporate in the conversation as much as possible. But I can assure you we will um, redirect the questions uh, to our speakers and to IAG uh, and see how we can get your answers uh, uh, up on the platform again. Uh, and uh, um, i have inspired again uh, by the conversation that can help us uh, lead to uh, uh, improve uh, our Delft agenda uh, in the course of the next days. Thanks again, Lent. Thanks again, William. And thanks so much, Anna, for supporting us uh, and making sure everything went amazingly well. Uh, and uh, thanks again to uh, uh, IHE uh, for organizing this uh, show. Anna, perhaps do you have last comments for practical? Yes, I'll just share my screen really fast to be able to share on how the audience can engage in the conversation after we finish this webinar. So as you're, as Hank already mentioned, the questions that have not been able to be answered uh, during this live session, they'll be answered um, afterwards in the post recording of this webinar itself. Uh, this will also allow the participants who were not able to join us due to time zone constraints to engage in the discussion. Um, I would also like to encourage everyone to engage in social media with our hashtag CapDevSimp to spread the, the message that we're collecting during this conference far and wide and invite everyone to contribute to the Delft agenda by following the URL that you can see just down below. You can also find it in the chat. And now I'm going to give back the floor to you, Hank. Yes. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for this. Thanks again for uh, uh, the speakers and the audience. Lent, um, uh, I wish you a great day <laughs> that started real early. Uh, I hope you are able to see a, an amazing sunrise uh, in Utah. Uh, and William in Uganda, stay safe. Uh, to all of you, stay safe. Uh, and hope to uh, be able to uh, engage with you more. Thanks again. Thank you very much.